Me is a film that uh, we, actually it's one of the only, one of the few we didn't actually see at a festival, I don't think. No, we were, it doesn't matter why, we all got to see it. We all really liked it, it's really fun. Uh, it's a little disturbed in places, and, and that's also fun. Uh, and then, but we also, more importantly, we just love Pat Healy, the director and star of the film. He's a Chicago guy. He, um, he's, he knows this theater. I, I think I might have first met him at this theater uh, years ago when he was here for a screening of The Innkeepers. And, and we, like I said, we just love him. He's a great actor. We all know that. And he's uh, been in a lot of stuff that we love. Uh, and we, we can talk about that during the Q&A. But before we get started, let's bring Pat up to say a, say a few words about the movie. Thank you. I want to thank Steve and Brian and the whole gang for bringing me here. So happy you're all here. This is a really good movie to see with an audience, even though you could all be sitting at home right now or watching it tomorrow and enjoying the nice evening out. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, as he said, it's a short ass movie. <laughs> Um, it's 84 minutes, so by the time you realize it sucks, it's over. <laughs> and then uh, I will be here afterwards to talk with Steve and uh, answer any questions you might have. And uh, enjoy. All right. Thanks. There we go. All right. Let's bring Pat Healy back up. I don't come up until the mic is back on. That's just that's, no, that's, that's my contract. thing. It's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as, mu as much as this film, and I've seen it reviewed different ways that people will say it's, it's bad. A, it's a dark comedy. Yeah, it's bad. It's, you know, it's like a dark comedy. It's a character study. It's a you know some sort of suspense thing. At its core, it's it's I think it's a mystery because these two people. We, we know pretty early on that something's going on in their lives that has brought them to this point. Different things for both of them, but I think the film is sort of an unspooling of whatever factors have gotten them to that point. Yes. Uh, talk about it from, from, I mean, what, was that how the script was originally? Did you sort of work it into that? or what? Talk about like where you wanted this to sort of come from. Yeah, the original script had a lot of elements of, I, you know, I, I, I didn't know where I was gonna go this, a uh, young man that I work with on a short film who I didn't even really know was a writer uh, named Mike Mikowski uh, and I became friends and he gave me the script not telling me you know that was something he was interested in having me do or anything like that uh, just sort of would you read my script and, and I did um, and I I loved it because it, as you're saying like it's sort of like you're you're, uh, you're peeking in a keyhole and then you're sort of like getting uh, you know, more and more and more and more information, you know, you're getting a little further into it. Um, and that was great uh, because you just read so many scripts and they're, they are um, based on the 8,000 screenplay books that are out there that tell you that audiences want this and then they want this and they want that and it's like, no, they don't. They want to be surprised. They, they don't uh, want to see, they don't want to know exactly what's going to happen next. So. So there was that element to it. There was an element of um, of uh, film noir that I saw. That you know, that's the um, you know uh, alluring uh, blonde woman that leads the schmuck down the rabbit hole, and then <laughs> he digs a deeper and deeper hole for himself. And then that is also uh, the heart of the screwball comedy, which is you know the sort of sister genre to the. Uh, to the, to the noir, so the flip side of it, which was, uh, you know, very amusing to me. I think, I think if anything, I, I thought of it uh, more as a comedy than, than, than maybe Mike did or m maybe other people saw uh, and, you know, brought those aspects to it. But I, 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 it's funny, I was just thinking of a movie that I was watching and it's just, it's just nice when a movie Oh, I was talking with my brother about a noir by Otto Preminger called Where the Sidewalk Ends, and there's a, a, you don't know a lot about the characters when it starts, and it's like every scene is like a new piece of information, and it's a movie from 1950, and 
It's weird that they knew how to do that then, but don't know how to do it now. In the same way that it's weird that with all the you know, social progress that we have, that um, roles for women were so much better in the 1930s and 1940s than they are now. Well, like, why is that? Women drive so much of the business even. You know, they buy so many of the tickets. Um, so there were things like that that I like about older movies that I thought this uh, script had. Um, that I thought I could do something with that were interesting to me. And I think that is part of, mystery is part of being a director or even being an actor, which is like constantly discovering things about it and each sort of new thing that you discover. Even now as I watch it, I discover new things that I hadn't thought about it before, it's sort of like you know solving a mystery and discovering more clues about it and things like that. So I think that's accurate. So when the, when the screenplay was given to you, this wasn't necessarily, you. This wasn't saying, hey, will you direct this? It was just, can you take a look at it? No, yeah. At what fact, point did you make, I guess I'm wondering, what, what point did that leap happen? Yeah, it was given to me and not, it just, you know, I wrote a script, would you read it? And uh, he's a very modest, nice young man. And uh, I said I would, and then of course, like every jackass in Hollywood, it sat in my email box for like two months. And then I finally read it and I, I thought it was great. And he was like, well, yeah, he had, he and I had worked on a short film together that he produced. and. And, and he had written it for, you know, for me to be in. And then I, I got very excited about it and I had you know, not directed anything since shorts I directed it 16 years ago. And um, I was speaking about it very animatedly to my friend Evan Katz who made uh, Cheap Thrills and, and Small Crimes that we did together. And he said, well, it sounds like you should direct it. And I went, well, oh, that's, yeah, I should do that. And you know, I had never thought about directing something I hadn't written before. Um, so I went to him with that idea and he said he didn't think it was a good idea. And then I went to, I had a couple, I had, you know, just people that I know from the business, especially the independent film scene who, uh, you know, are legitimate producers and, and one of them was Jay Duplass and I called Jay and he called me right back and I was just really kind of asking advice, how should I go about trying to get this produced and um, I want to act in it, maybe I want to direct it and he asked to see the script and he gave it to uh, Mel Eslin, who was the, someone they had hired to, uh, at that time, just hired to, to run and sort of be the producer of these, these movies that they were making. And uh, I met with her the next day and she said, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, I can not act in it or not direct it. Or they said, no, no, we think you should, you should do both. And they just started up talking to me about who I wanted to be in it with me, so. And speaking of that, because I, I was lucky enough a couple of weeks ago to, to interview Taylor Schilling about this film, and she said the reason, I mean, the initial way it got to her was through Mark Duplass, who That's she right. had worked with on the overnight a couple of years ago, which we played at this festival, by the way. And um, and so she just, implicit, just because she trusted him and, and he knew her and knew her taste and, and knew she was looking for something different than what people had seen her do before, right. which this certainly is, um, uh, that, that, yeah, that she just said yes, like, you yeah, know, so... That's... Yeah, she did right away, yeah. I mean, we did some rewrites on it over August, between August and November, I guess, and then we gave it to her, and she said yes right away. I, you know, and then she sort of said to me on the... When I first spoke to her on the phone was with Mark, who I have known for a while, but I hadn't met her. She said, oh, it's got kind of like a... Like a Hepburn and Tracy, like Pat and Mike kind of vibe to her, and I was like, yeah, okay, she understands that I, that's the kind of you know, thing that I, that I want to do, you know, that's not all it is obviously, but she, she understood that very much. And, um, she's, you know, obviously got great dramatic chops and great comedic chops and she's, um, and she's legitimately crazy too. So like, that was like, those were like sort of the three boxes checked off. And, um, that's what that character had to be. And that's what she can do in spades. And I, yeah, I don't, I do think you see her do pieces of that in, in on Orange or in the overnight, but I don't think she really has ever sort of had the freedom to, to sort of fully embrace and let that freak flag fly and, and go go all in. And we just did and we used, you know, mostly the takes where she went the most all in. But, you know, you, you, she gave so many different versions of things that you can create this character that is I don't know what's going on in this movie because I don't know who this person is or what she's about or what what she's doing that I think really, I think that's what makes the movie work. But well, by, the, by the end of the film, when we realize 
what is going on and that she was in on this the whole time, we realized that both of you are, in real life, you're actors, but you're playing actors in this scenario. Right. And was that, and, and, and it's not a, especially well-written scenario necessarily. Right. But no, it's, it's terrible, it's yeah. A, yeah but the guy is a moron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. okay, and, and you can say that, and that's yeah. cool. No, but, um, but like, that, is me, that a, you that, mean my character. Is that yeah. a tough thing, that like, being an actor, playing an actor in this, like, bad? No, movie? it's really fun. I mean, I think, I think where it gets tough is you, you, you get so sort of involved in, and certainly a kind of work that I've done and that the, the, the way that I throw myself into things, you do tend to forget sometimes that you're in this super meta situation where you're supposed to be directing this movie and you're acting in it with this person and the two people that are in it are kind of, it's like two actors decided to be in something together but they're working from a different script but they don't know it. And then, you know, that was kind of happening where I would be in a scene with her because I, everything was sort of meticulously planned out and all the shots were meticulously planned out and how it was going to cut together and all that so that on the day I could be acting and, and my producer Mel Esling could say action and cut it and look at the monitor and all that stuff because I, I just knew that I couldn't do that so um, I would get caught up in what she was doing and, and, or going like what the hell is going on or what is she doing um, and that just lends itself naturally to, to, to the relationship between the two characters because that's sort of actually what was happening. I, I want to, uh, it's funny watching you play this part because I, you you don't often get cast as the tough guy, but you do horrible things on right. film sometimes. Like, you know, compliance being the most obvious one, but he's not a tough guy, he's just an evil bastard. The telephone and, tough guy. But sometimes you do play tough, like here he's pretending to be a tough guy. Yeah, he's peacocking. You have, say, but you yeah. have like this very interesting relationship where you because even in uh, small crimes you're you're playing a tough guy in that too but it's a, say, a lot of the same idea that he's he's toughed up he's uh, yeah he's um do yeah. you i mean do you sort of understand do you sort of understand in a certain degree that you people might not feel particularly threatened by you but yeah. at the same time that you can play with that and that actually makes it funny that makes this movie funny yeah i think that, that's that the, i mean i sort of see myself as a person who thought of himself this way for a really long time and uh, I you know well the way I grew up I wasn't exactly encouraged to be uh, sensitive or uh, vulnerable so uh, I became an actor who you know worshipped you know Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and Mickey Rourke and all these sort of people and sort of thought well I'll be that and you know um, then you know well what would happen to me if I didn't go to therapy and um, get over myself as I'd wear that jacket and think it looked good on me and wear that wig and think no one notices and he's got the gloves and the turtleneck that Steve McQueen uh, has in Bullet and uh, there's a couple things, the sunglasses, yeah, the, that, that's actually me still, but uh, he, he, there's, there's two things that are not, uh, that I'm doing in the movie that, that, that aren't uh, explained, which is I wear lifts in my shoes and I have a spray tan which are if you know me are not things that I usually do but uh, yeah he he's just uh, that's how he sees himself and he's you know it's when you when they get together that you realize that he's quite bad at it and quite it's a very fragile sort of eggshell around him and it's very easily penetrated and you know the movie's kind of about how he needs to get to this place where he is you know uh, allows himself to be who he is so she makes him feel it's real and he feels it's real and sort of ultimate act is he's you know his wig gets knocked off and he's stripped of his jacket and he cries in front of another man i mean you can't really get more of a journey than that it's you know it's sort of like how you i guess it's emotionally autobiographical in that sense that, that that's sort of my journey of like learning to embrace my, my, my sensitivity and my vulnerability and all that kind of stuff uh, um, by, you know, uh, uh, this woman who, for better or worse, comes in like a tornado and turns my life upside down. Everyone make sure to give Pat a hug after the movie. Yeah. I'm all right. <laughs> uh, we have a microphone. I'm going to ask one more question. We have a microphone set up right here. We're going to start the line for questions. Uh, the last thing I want to know, well, you mentioned it. I want to talk about this wig. Uh, how many audition, how many wigs did you audition 
to, to, to get to this horrible creature? <laughs> not well, not too many. Like I had, I I found this really amazing uh, wig designer. So she, um, her name is Stacy Schneiderman, and she hasn't done many movies. I think maybe it's her second movie. She's worked on Broadway for years, and like Spider Man, and, uh, um, and oh God, you name it, so many plays. And um, and and so I just had a lot of conversations with her about what it was, and references to other movies, and things like that. And actually, uh, you guys are going to show this Burt Reynolds movie next, but uh, there was <laughs> that, there was this um, movie called Malone that Burt Reynolds was in um, that uh, uh, in 1987, and like you can see the line in the back of the wig and things like that. And um, and then there's like weird things like people go like, oh, it's like William Devane's wig in um, Family Plot, you know, the Hitchcock movie, which is like like unconscious things that I think you know. I, I just had a lot of discussions with her. And then we picked out like a really cheap wig. So like the jacket was like $300, but like the wig is like $30. And then she did amazing things to it. She cut around it and, you know, puffed it up and did all kinds of things. And I tried it on that first day we shot. And I was just like, this, this, yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes, let's go for it. I'd love to ask about the score by Heather McIntosh, who's just become one of my favorite modern composers. Yeah, she also did those lines. So what was it like trying to find the right tone? It was really, really hard. Um, so I hired Heather because I, you know, she did the score for Compliance, which is a movie that I was in, and it's a great score. And it's actually her first score. Um, you know, she's worked with a lot of. She's a really great musician. She's worked with a lot of rock bands and things like that. But um, we tried all kinds of things because we, the way that we tested this was we tested it through sort of small groups of like 15, 20 people. That's sort of the Duplass model of doing things with people that we know or whose taste we trust. Um, and um, it, there was a, a problem with people understanding what it was and, uh, you know, tonally. And um, that was fine with me because I want people to be confused by it. But I, uh, I, I did a lot in editing and then Heather came. Heather was working all along, God bless her. Just, she wrote so much that we just didn't use. And then we finally, settled on this. Oh, uh, it was Jay Duplass actually who said pick one score, because we had just music from all kinds of different kinds of movies in there as temp music. And we picked one score, I'm not going to say what it was because I actually hated the score, but it was, it was totally right. And then we realized, well how do we make this cool, because that sort of makes the movie work. Um, and Heather uh, and I love like Henry Mancini, and John Barry, like 60s caper music. Uh, there's a little like third man in there and there's some uh, things like that where it, it felt like it had that kind of throwback vibe to it. And we really, once we sort of settled on that, she wrote the little piece that's the ex-wife sort of theme that has this kind of like reminiscence of like a Atlantic City a boardwalk fun that's, you know, sort of a device in some older movies that I like too. And then from there, we just started playing with harpsichord and dulcimer and things like that. The Odd Couple, the Neil Hefty score for The Odd Couple, which is you know sort of iconic, was like a big one because we have that sort of relationship in that movie. And and we worked basically in, I want to say, a little bit in December and mostly in January. I was shooting a, a television pilot in New Mexico, so we were uh, doing it, you know via email and phone and things like that. And then when I came back in January, we, we just went to work. And she like she plays a lot of music, uh, instruments herself. She plays all the strings herself, so violin, cello. Um, and then she hired an, uh, a, a bassoonist and a flautist. Did I say that right? And um, it sounds like an orchestra to me and a drummer. It sounds like a, a scored movie, which, you know, you don't you don't see a lot in independent movies and, and you don't really hear people talk about scores at all anymore. Uh, and I love movie scores. And um, I'm so pleased that so many people are writing about the score in reviews and people like you, somebody always asks about it in the <laughs> Q&A and all that stuff. And I, I think it's great because I, I grew up in an era where we loved movie scores and we connected those scores in the movies and we bought the albums and all those things. And I don't know if there's gonna be an album for this, but um, I hope that there is, but um, I just think she's amazing, and I hope she does, you know, bigger movies and gets paid. Absolutely. I'd buy the album. Great, thank, thank you. you.
That's one order. <laughs> Let the orchard build. Yeah, uh, first I just wanted to thank you for your work. Uh, I'm always happy when you pop up in a movie because the movie gets oh, better. Oh, thank you. Like, your characters are really intriguing and watchable. I can't take my eyes off the screen. Um, what, what I was wondering was how did you, uh, I guess, research this role? Like, did you talk to like actual kidnapped role players or like? What was your process? Like, I, I was actually going to ask you, this, does this exist? I, like, I don't like think it happened? exists. I think, <laughs> I think if it existed, it would be, a, I think this would happen. So I think that um, it probably doesn't exist. I mean, you know, research for me is just living with the script a lot and sort of thinking about the character and internal things and, and you know, external things like we've talked about, like the hair and the costume and things like that and sort of letting it come alive with this because I had a unique relationship where I, with the writer where I was developing the script with him and the producers and, um, and Taylor and Mark to, to a certain degree too and, and uh, because I was directing it I was always thinking about every single thing and I was reading it every day and just sort of character live with me and a lot of it is me um, or, you know sort of, sort of exaggerated aspects of my personality that uh, the writer understood about me or liked from my other work and then a lot of it is just um, uh, what, you know, so basically finding the basic truth in a situation. So some of the people that worked on this movie didn't realize we were making a comedy until it came out. <laughs> and and I, I kind of take it as a compliment because I, I don't think that my goal was not to play funny. It was to, to, to play the truth of the situation. So if the scene is supposed to be funny, it'll be funny because it's written funny and if it's supposed to be tense, et cetera. So for me, you know, my training as an actor uh, informs that, that part of directing it because it's just about like, well, what's the overall sort of arc of this character in the story? And then in each individual scene, what is the character going for? What does he want? What are they, what are they trying to get? You know, what are the obstacles? All those kind of basic, you know, theater acting 101 things. Um, I'm not big on research. Um, I, I have to be sometimes. Um, I'm about to do something that's historical and I'm, there's a lot of research involved and I'm excited about that. But I, um, I, I, I generally like to use my imagination in the, the script. Um, that, that's the most fun for me. Yeah. All right. Thank and you. again, I don't think this exists. So if you can find <laughs> no, it. it does. My, my aunt met someone. Um, oh, really? Who does this. Um, Tell her to run away. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. All right, yeah. I'll look into that. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks for the, thanks for the nice things you said. Oh, yes, hello. Great film. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. She said it was great. <laughs> it was great, everybody. It was. No, um, and my question was actually about, has Heather ever That was what my original question was about. Um, and, the, and, to, and, to, and to hold on to your question, because I would like to say that there are not many female composers. In fact, Heather was inducted into the Academy of Motion Picture, Picture Arts and Sciences last year because of this sort of broad, sort of, you know, trying to bring people into the branch. And that's why we had a much more diverse, you know, set of nominees this year, bringing in uh, women in every branch, bringing in people of color every branch. and. And, and all kinds of people. So, and she absolutely deserves that. But so, thank you for saying that. Yeah, absolutely. It was wonderful to see it, and um, I'm a huge score junkie. So good. Um, yeah, I love them. They're great. Yes. Uh, okay, so I came up with a different question. Um, obviously, this movie has a ton of absurdity. Like, there's just so much going on in each scene, and it's sort of tense. And you're like, should I laugh? But um, my question is. Do you have a favorite scene that you filmed? Do I have a favorite scene? Mm -hmm. uh, I have two. Okay. Well, the key scene obviously is like the scene that, you know, that's sort of like the go-to scene and that's the scene that always plays so well. And it was um, very meticulously planned out, but what we sort of didn't take into account was that, you know, in the script it just says he swallows a key and you see that in old <laughs> movies or whatever. Um, but now keys are, you know, the size of a bar of soap. So when it showed up on set, it was like, oh, well, we have something here. That's like, like a great surprise, you know? So I set about um, finding something that I could, because 
again, my commitment to the reality of the situation, that I could swallow realistically, because I couldn't swallow that, obviously. Although I would have if I hadn't found anything. And I just tried all these different things off the craft service table, and then I, um, I found this rolled up, a, a piece of rye bread, and I rolled it up. And it fit it, just in my throat where it was choking me, but I knew that the saliva would eventually make it go down. <laughs> and I just, I just played it out. And then, and so everyone on, so the scene's supposed to end when I swallow it, and then the phone rings. But everybody on the set who was calling action and the AD was supposed to say ring, ring, were just like, <laughs> and the camera just kept going. And so Taylor just kept going, and she was saying, you know, spit out the keys, and then I did the whole thing with, I'll try, and I'll, I started trying to make myself throw up and all that stuff. So that, there's not a lot of improvisation in the movie, but that was improvised. So I, I love that scene a lot. I, I really love the scene in the bathtub where she's, she, cause she's really great in that scene. She's, she does it that thing where she's hilarious and then she's crying and you feel so bad for her and then she's terrifying and then she's, I mean, she just, and that's like one take of her. Um, and then I really like the scene, I guess for personal reasons, I just like the way that I executed it and I like the way it's written. I like everything about it, which is the scene in the cabin where he talks about his ex-wife and there's some nice, uh, uh, it's kind of quiet uh, as opposed to some other things in the movie and um, just sort of watching her react silently to it and I love the music there, I love Heather's music there. That was like one of those things where it's just like, I, I thought about it in that way and it just, it came off just right, you know, just how I imagined it would, and um, yeah, those those are my favorites, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I think that this is the last question. I think. So you said there were rewrites. Mm -hmm. What changed in that process? Um, you know, a lot of it is just sort of like, you know, the basic like bringing my voice to it. You know, things that uh, humor and things like that. There's there's condensing of things. There's there's um, uh, for example, uh, there, there, there's, there's heightening of things. So for example, Natalie, the sister, doesn't come over. She just calls. I said, well, why does she, why does she just come over? Like, that'll be funny, you know? And then she goes down in the basement and all that. Um, um, the ending originally was much longer. And everyone was kind of feeling like the rooftop scene is the climax of the movie or the, you know, sort of denouement of the movie. And it's kind of over after there, but we want to know about like what how Ray feels. So there was a whole thing where he um, goes home and burns and throws away all of his kidnap paraphernalia and he goes back to his sister's house and he starts to repair the relationship with the sister and the kids and then he, he gets a job in a fast food restaurant and he's flipping burgers and that guy from the beginning that Jim O'Hara plays uh, comes in and um, runs away and he says, no, 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 I want to apologize to you and he thinks he's running away but he's actually running out to show him all his receipts from the salads that he's bought and all stuff. And I had this, since people were saying like, oh, it kind of feels like the movie ends on the rooftop, but I, I didn't want it to end on the rooftop. I wanted to, I liked all that stuff that was in there. I just came up with what we pretentiously referred to as the city lights ending, which is just no dialogue and just music and sound and, and faces and two faces, people looking at each other. And it communicates all the ideas of that. It's, and it has pathos and it has uh, laughs and, and all those things. So that was sort of my big contribution to the script. Other than that, there's, there's little things like I had um, a line from an old script I wrote that just happened to start with a guy in a bank interviewing for a job and, and he tells the teller off and then comes back and asks if he can have his parking validated. I mean, you know, it's like little things like that. And then we're, you know, we're doing little things as we're, we're shooting it too, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's basically it, yeah. I mean, most of it is, is really what, what Mike came up with, which just was, was great, and, and it is great, and, and it, um, it's just interpreting that script. Right. Um, so this is a unique situation, too, because this, this is the only time you're going to see this movie in Chicago on a big screen. So, uh, and so it's on VOD already, so you can point people to it, uh, and you should. And, and, I, and I should give, you mentioned it before, but... Um, the other, like Small Crimes, which is a, a Netflix original, right? Yeah. That, is, that if you guys, uh, if you guys like cheap thrills, that director, that filmmaker, and Macon Blair wrote a script, and you're in it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a new movie. That's small. It's already on Netflix. It, was on, it went on like the end of uh, April, I think. 
and you should absolutely check it. Oh wait, there's somebody else at the microphone, even though I said that was the last question. Oh, it's okay, my yeah. uncle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go I have a quickie two-part question. Right. First, what, what's your next director uh, foray? I don't, I don't know. And part two, can I be in it? <laughs> <laughs> Do that. <laughs> uh, Pat, we, we love you. Thank you so Thanks. much for coming out and Thanks, being everybody. a part of it. Thanks for sticking around. And, uh, are you oh yeah, it's uh, so the movie's now out on iTunes and Amazon and all of those things. And if you want to, um, at some point apparently it'll be on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, it'll be on Netflix at some point. But um, yeah, please uh, tell people to watch it, tweet about it. If you didn't like it, I assume you're not here still. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I'll hang out a little bit if you want to. So you guys want to say hi and say hi. Thanks, everyone. Ask questions that were too embarrassing to ask in front of the crowd.